So errors are a part of every programming language and each one of those languages handles it slightly differently. So in the context of Rust, we're talking about recoverable errors and unrecoverable errors. Hi, my name is Ricky and welcome to the dev method. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, it is the dev method. And if you guys really like this video or you want more like this, uh, subscribe by pressing the button below or give a thumbs up. And if you do that, there's actually a little cool sparkle animation it does and looks pretty cool. You should do it. So recoverable errors are the ones that you can catch while your program is running. When you catch these errors while they're running, you then decide what the program is actually going to do to try and recover from it. Or maybe you need to tell the caller of your function that an error occurred and let them deal with it. Unrecoverable errors are the ones where your program just cannot run anymore because it just doesn't know what to do. So for example, if you reach beyond the bounds of an array and you're going into uncharted territory of your application memory, who knows what's gonna happen. So Rust will just say, nope, I'm not gonna continue anymore. So Rust does not have exceptions, but they do have a result type. The result type you use for recoverable errors. And then there's also panic, a panic macro. And that would be used to just say, hey, we can't continue anymore. We are unrecoverable at this point. So let's start with panic. So when a panic occurs, your Rust application actually does this step of unwinding uh, and is slowly cleaning up all the function calls that you're currently in on your application stack. Uh, there is an option to not have this behavior if you simply just want your operating system to handle it. You can just do an abort. So you get that choice. So for example, let's take a look at the cargo.toml file. If we wanted this this application that we're making to uh, use that abort pattern where it doesn't clean up, lets the operating system clean up. Uh, we could do that for release if we did profile.release in these brackets here, and then just below it, panic equals, and then abort. So you got options. So here I have an example of just the main function of our application, and it's just panicking. That's all it does. So let's run it and see what happens. All right, so if we take a look at the output together, um, it's saying that um, thread, and then it says main, panicked at uh, crash and burn, uh, which is what we wrote in our, uh, in our string here. Um, and it says exactly what line it was, 17. It even says the column, so that's kind of cool. Uh, but now there's also another way to look at this. Uh, if you want, like, uh, from what function did we panic at? So let me just show you an example. All right, so let's say we have a function called run, and we're going to call that from main. Um, that's the one that's going to panic, right? So as we run it before, it's saying if you use this rust underscore backtrace one in front of your cargo run, so something like this, uh, you're going to get backtrace information. So let's take a look at it as an example. So on the right side, we had what we previously ran. And then on the left side, we have our uh, backtrace that comes with it. So if we take a look, um, we can see Rust began unwind. All right, so uh, because we're not in release mode, we're just in debug mode. And it says panicking. But if we keep going down, this one again says panicking. But this is from the core library in Rust. So here's the error handling right here um, in run. So that's the method run. Error handling is actually the name of my project right now. So that's why it's called that. And then we have main, because main called run. And you get the idea. You can just go up in the stack and see where the backtrace leads you. All right, so let's look at the backtrace of this application here. So the example is uh, we're going out of the bounds of this vector. And let's just see what happens. All right, so we got that backtrace again. And then it says it panicked, and then it tells you the reason here. See, it says index out of bounds. The len is three, but the index that we're asking to uh, introspect into the vector is uh, 99. So that doesn't work, right? That's a runtime crash. So that about covers it for unrecoverable errors. We'll come back to some of those in a second. But let's take a look at a recoverable error. Um, so real quick, just as a review, we have result type. I don't know if you guys remember this one from previous videos, uh, but we have the actual type when it's successful, so that's designated by T, 
and then we're going to be looking at some sort of error which is designated by E. So let's say in this example, um, if we look here, uh, we're going to try and read a file or open it. So we have a file, we're going to open it on line 17, and it's called hello.txt, and it goes into F. So what is the type of F? So that is actually a result type, just like what I just showed a second ago. Um, one of its variants is the actual success, so that's the first thing here, which is file. So this type will um, right now be a result of either file or this next thing, which is an error. And we don't know which one we have yet, and that's why on line 19 we use match. So if we match on F, we're going to assign this back into F. Or so uh, we have an OK arm and then an error arm. So if it's OK, then we're going to return the file. But this can only be one type, right? We can't say if it's the error, then it's going to return the other thing. So this has to be like a determined type. And so the idea here is that the panic, um, we're going to panic, and we're never going to return. The application is just going to crash. So the only choice is really that this is a file. So that's the idea. Um, otherwise, the application just stops running, and we never even get to assigning the variable. So this example is a little bit longer, but um, the whole point of this one here is that we have almost the same exact structure, except we want to figure out exactly what kind of error we actually have. So um, the standard library, the I.O., uh, has something for us that we can use. So line uh, 18 is our regular open the file, and then we try and match and see if it's OK or if we got an error. And uh, in order to use these um, on line 15, we have uh, a use statement for the standard library, I.O., then we have error kind. So error kind, this then now is in scope for us to use. Uh, so what is that? And we match on that. And then this, starting from line uh, 25 here, we're going to check and see if it's like not found. So that's one thing. Now on line 29, um, we actually have just like a catch-all, so it's like, all right, so some other error. And then in this case, we're not handling it, so that's the unrecoverable error, so we just panic. But if we do have an option to recover, um, that's what we get in this not found. Now we're going to take this just one step further. So we recover um, from the error in this case, and how could we recover? Well, with this example, we're trying to open a file, and it's not there. So if it's not there, we could just as a default uh, behavior of this application or this program, we can actually create it because we know what the name of it is. So if it's not there, we'll go ahead and create it. And if the creation is just fine, then we get an OK. And if it's not, then we get a different type of panic or a different type of error. Um, and that's uh, this custom message here. So let's look at an alternative form of how that we can write this error. You might think it's messy, you might not, but we're going to look at an alternative way of writing it. So the lines definitely got smaller, or just less lines. But the, instead of doing a match, um, or, or storing this in F and then doing a match on F, we actually have this method here, unwrap or else. And what it does is actually uh, it gives you back some sort of closure or some sort of callback function. And that first parameter in there is actually an error. And from there, you can get its kind. And then we're just using an if statement, so a conditional, just to see what kind of error kind it actually is. But then uh, we create the file if it's not found. And that is that. Um, we don't do anything else. And then you got the panic. So it's just a different variation from what we had a couple moments ago. So if you've been uh, running some of these code samples as you're following along or pausing and following along, um, you go ahead and delete that hello.txt file because it probably would have already been made for you. Um, but then we have this option here. Um, if you want to see this error, that's why you don't want the file to be on your computer yet. So if you start from scratch and uh, you don't have this file, it's not found, and you do an open on it and unwrap. Um, so this is different. We're not actually trying to recover from the error anymore. We're just saying, all right, we're going to unwrap this and assume that we always have the successful case. And if we do, the program can continue to run. And if not, we're actually going to get a panic um, or an error. So that's what this is going to do for us here. So this return type is no longer just like a result type with the success or the error. But this is the actual success itself, so that type T, uh, or that first generic type of result. So that's what F would end up being. So let me run this and show you what it looks like. So uh, ignore the part about the unused variable here, but uh, notice as it's uh, finished and then running, 
we have here uh, result unwrap, right? So it's actually an associated function on result. Um, and then we get the, uh, we got an error is what it's saying. And then it gives us in this kind of like JSONified uh, output um, that this is the message, this is the code, this is the kind. So some, a little bit of extra information. And of course we can do the backtrace if now that we know how to do that, we can do that too. So this was a simple example of using unwrap, um, but there could be times where it's okay to use it. So let me show you here. Um, now, this is a different part of the standard library. It's the net part for like networking. And uh, we're pulling out this IP address kind. And what we get here from that, uh, that module is that we get this parse of a string and it parses it into an IP address for us. Um, and then we're actually using unwrap. Now, we as humans ahead of time know better than the compiler that this will always be successful. Now, if it was very a variable string or something that was like constructed and then parsed, maybe we wouldn't use something like this. But we, we can do it because we know a little bit better than the compiler at this point. We know that this will always succeed. And then just as another example, um, Let's say we have a struct guess, and we want to validate some of its input as you're creating that struct. So if you look on line 18, we have this associated function new, which is a constructor uh, for the guess struct. And we're just doing some validation. We're saying if the value is less than 1 or if the value is greater than 0, that's when we need to do this like custom error message, this panic. Um, otherwise, go ahead and create. Uh, guess. So this one might be good because you're developing some sort of library or module and you want the developer at like development time to know that this is invalid input and you shouldn't really be doing this. So that's when you would maybe use something like this. Otherwise, when you're creating your libraries or your different programs, you should probably be handling uh, these cases and not so many uh, unwraps or whatnot to like do the shortcut and get ahead of it. So another shortcut um, you might have also seen too, besides unwrap, is uh, expect. So here I have an example. Line 17 shows it. Um, it says ex expect, and then it's a custom error message there. So instead of doing the validation here, we're just saying like, you know, if we don't get the success, then go ahead and throw the exception, but give me this error message instead. It's just another way to kind of write um, your own custom error message as you're developing. So what if you do want to handle all the possible outcomes? Well, it gets a little uh, overwhelming sometimes. So let me show you an example here. Um, this is a function that is basically just reading from the file, and we're going to read a username um, from that file. So that's, that's the idea. So you might have a function, um, and this is very similar to what we've been doing, uh, that opens up a file. Then we match to get the error, the pro proper error. And now we want to put it into a string. So then we use the file's uh, read to string which takes a, uh, a, a mutable, a borrowed mutable s here. And uh, then we return s if it's OK. Um, if not, then uh, we have an error, we return the error. So we have here the result type as the return type for this function. So that's OK. We could do something like this. No worries. And, and these are some of the ways that you would actually write a function like this. So this type of writing here would be like error propagation. You're saying to the caller, you go ahead and handle the error however you want. So notice here there's no panic written anywhere because we're just going to let the, the, the developer or the caller of this function decide what the error actually should be. So now let's go a little bit further um, and use a really cool feature within Swift, which is like this question mark operator. So I have the same function, but written with this question mark operator. And the whole idea here is that it's, it's doing the same thing as what we had before. But now, instead of doing the match and checking for the uh, OK and the error, um, it, we put a question mark after it. So that's why line 18, we open the file, we put this question mark on it. And it just says, like if we do have the error, we're going to return that. So that still satisfies this return type here. Um, same thing with the string. If we want that, and then we want to uh, do something like this, where we're reading from the string again, but then we do that question mark at the end of it. So uh, if it doesn't work out and it's an error, then it still satisfies the return type here. And uh, Rust kind of just handles this for you, so it's pretty cool. Now, another way we could do this, um, you might have already thought about this too, is we could chain these together. Um, so this is like the equivalent of that. And uh, the idea being, um, Either one of these, if they return an error, then it changes it together. But uh, in the end, we actually do want this success part. So we just put this uh, mutable string. We just uh, move it up one line. And then we could chain these together like this. 
So one thing to keep in mind is if, uh, you know, something like Swift or even JavaScript, they have that question mark and there's like optional chaining, like if it's null or undefined in JavaScript or just nil in Swift, you do these like question mark dot and then keep going. Um, so this is kind of like that, but not, not really. Um, there's a little bit more to it and uh, we'll take a look at that. Now, just in case if you're curious, you can actually uh, narrow this down even further from the code. There's a uh, in the standard library, there's this uh, module um, FS, which means file system. And there's a read to string. Because it's so common to you know, pull a file, read it as a string, there's actually a built-in uh, function for it. So you do that, and it satisfies that same uh, return type. And therefore, you're propagating the error still. So let's uh, take that back um, just a second. Let, let's go to just the main function again, and we want to open the file. Now, let's say in the main function, we don't have a return type. But we, we could add one there um, to satisfy using this uh, question mark. So let's run this, and let's just see what the error might actually be. All right, so um, besides the unused thing here, we're saying we got the question mark operator can only be used in a function that returns uh, results or option, or here's this fun part, uh, implements from residual. Make that a little bit. Can I get that on the next line? Here it is, from residual. I'll leave it bigger from now on. Um, so that's kind of cool. There's this thing uh, from residual. It's a trait. Um, if you implement that, that is also something you can use. So you can kind of take that question mark and um, customize it to your application needs and make it a little bit more like Rust-like, make it more natural. So here's an example. Because we know it could be used on option, we have a function here that returns an option. Okay. And then line 14 says, all right, we're going to get text, and we want the lines from it. And then we want uh, the next, which is probably like the next line. I don't know exactly, but that's what I'm guessing from the look of this. And then he uses the question mark. So that's an option. So now it is more like that Swift or JavaScript part where we're actually saying, like, OK, if it's there, then you, it's safe to unwrap and then use. But if it's not there, you're going to return nil here in Rust. So that's kind of cool. So there we go. We have something we can use. And uh, if if any one of these, if let's say it's okay, and we get to this last part, chars get or get the characters, then we do last, then we're all good. Um, even if last returned an option as well, this would satisfy all of that. That's what that chaining can do for us. So back at that main function, let's say we wanted to do it ourselves right now without uh, doing a from residual implementation. We have here uh, seventeen. OK, and then it opens up the file. But we do need that result type here. So uh, if you haven't seen this before, or if you're um, maybe not remembering from previous videos that I made, that this uh, so this open parenthesis and the closed parenthesis together just mean like nothing, or a unit type, or, or void, you might think of it like that. And that's where we can return OK here. But if we get an error anytime um, in this call, it actually propagates it as an error. Um, just ignore the box thing for now. Just know that that's a way to at least accomplish this if you're trying to look for a way to do that. And then just to take it a little bit further, um, any type that implements the standard libraries, process, modules, uh, trait of termination, that's what you can actually put here as the return type of main. So if you're looking to do different return types other than this one here, uh, as long as it implements that termination, then you'd be able to do that here in, um, in this example. So thanks for watching. If you guys liked the video, you give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more. Otherwise, uh, thanks for watching this error handling in Rust. Um, see you again. Have a good one.